Welcome back to Crimepedia. I am your host, Morgan, and with me is Cherry. I'm not doing the long intro for you like I did yesterday. <laughs> You've run out of words now, so we're back to, we're back to just know. Cherry. I'm just Cherry this week. I would never <laughs> run out of words for you, Cherry. Oh, I my, love my words for you are infinite. Oh, what are you after? <laughs> <laughs> No. No, I'm um, sorry. I'm being mean, am I? No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is part two of our episode, Who Killed Sini, in regards to the the murder of Sinith Ducat in June uh, 3rd, 1980. Mm-hmm. If you've not listened to part one, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to that one before listening to this one, because you'll probably be highly confused of uh, about what we're talking about. And the reason we always say that is because people do tend to listen to the most recent episode first. So you need to just check whether we're doing a two part <laughs> episode or whether we're doing just a one episode for the week, because otherwise you're going to be like, mm-hmm. what? What's happened? What are you talking about? So, yeah, this I is know. part two. We've been good this week. We've got a two part for you. For those people that are being stubborn and not going back to listen to episode one, <laughs> how about you give us a rundown of what happened? See if you were paying attention, Cherry. Okay, so on the June the third, nineteen eighty, um, a scene. It was Asinith, which is um, Asinith Ducat, which we call in her Sini because that's what her family and friends called her, and we quite like it. It's quite nice. Um, was found, unfortunately, found in a culvert. Um, she had been hit in the head with a rock. Unfortunately, she had also been sexually abused and raped. She was eight years old. And that's just absolutely crazy. This case is still unsolved to this day. And it's just mad because the amount of evidence and the amount of people in the area, it was a voting day. So there were lots of people in the area. She was also found less than a block from her home. It's Mm, just absolutely crazy. Um, And so we have been talking about what happened, what could have possibly happened, what we know has happened. Um, and we've got to the point now through the timeline where we're going to talk about the suspects that we have for this case. Yes, that's correct. So uh, we have a few things to talk about. So we have um, – we talked about the timeline and we mm-hmm. talked about the number of potential witnesses that were in the area Yeah. who did not see anything. No. Okay. There was a lot. Now, there were. I mean, so we had – we had at least 13 people in the the general area that were either near or literally on top of where her body was in the, yeah. the, the stream. So I would say within, what, 10 feet of yeah. where her body was found. Re- yeah, that's So right. that's a lot. That's a lot yeah, of people that were in the area that were near where her body was but did not see her. Didn't see a thing. That's right. We have some other witnesses that, that appear – um, shortly after that gave the police some additional information that became helpful in their investigation. Right. So the first of these witnesses came to the police the morning of June 4th, 1980. So this was about 12 hours after mm. they found the body of Sini. Okay. Okay. So that witness told police that on June 3rd, she had turned her car east onto Waltham Road from Route 33, Riverside Drive, at approximately 3.25 p.m. She knew this because she arrived home at 3.30. So from that corner to her home is about a five-minute drive. Okay. Now, if you remember from yesterday, this would have been about five minutes after the last known sighting yeah, of Sini. Okay. Yeah. And so while she was driving – she observed a white male who was approximately six foot tall. He had a slim build. He had brown, normal length hair, no facial hair, no glasses. 
she stated that he was running from Malvern Road, where okay. that's the actually the street that Sini lived on, mm-hmm. south to the first community village, cradling what appeared to be a child. Oh, no. She further stated that the subject was running, but not running so as to avoid being struck by cars, and that the subject was wearing a white short sleeve button-down shirt and dark pants. So he wasn't in any like actual running gear. So it wasn't somebody who was just out for a run. This is somebody who was running mm. away from something or to something. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, right. um, and it seems like he just kind of darted out in front of, you know, across yeah. the street. So without yeah. looking. So that's that's right. how I kind of read it. So yeah. he's not really paying attention to his surroundings. He just has something in his arms that appears to be a child and is running. Oh. She said that she also saw a red bicycle. Oh, the bike again. And it was north between spruce trees at the first community village between Malvern and Hillside Drive. Right, okay. And so she continued to drive east on Waltham. That's not a huge that's not a huge stretch of road either. No, it's not. And so if you remember yesterday we kind of talked very briefly about that red bicycle that yeah. someone had saw on a wall on the very eastern part of uh, first community village. Yep. And and the first community village is a retirement complex. So that's sort of very close to where they found Sini's body in the culvert. Um, And so this, I know I've read a few reports that this bike has been, um, it's talked about quite a lot that it may be maroon, but they've actually worked out that it actually was red. It was a red bike that these people have seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they did determine it was a red bike. And I believe that they were able to, Later determined from, and I believe it's from our second witness, we're able to determine this actual brand. They determined that it was a Schwinn bicycle. Okay. So it was a red Schwinn bicycle that had, I, if I'm not mistaken, gold stars on it. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yep. That witness was eventually interviewed again under hypnotism. I'm not a, oh, I'm not a big, yeah. big into hypnotism. No. It doesn't sound like she really gave much more information. No. Other than what she originally said. Um, Okay. But once again, whatever she would have said under hypnosis, I I don't know if I put a whole lot of weight Mm. on that. Okay. Yeah, I'm a bit not sure about that. But I know that she did say that she saw she saw um, somebody who was carrying. some a girl that looked like a child that was unconscious um and that there wasn't anything really specific about him exactly only that he was clean shaven did she say he was in his like late teens early 20s did i remember that right yeah they they said probably in his 20s right okay Mm, okay i will say that the one thing that kind of gives her her original statement on the the fourth, some credibility. First off, it's 12 hours after they found her body. Yes, yeah, really close. So she mentions this red bicycle, which up to this point, I mean, this is this is right after the murder. So while they, they're reporting about the murder in, in the local newspapers, mm. they did not mention anything about the red bicycle at that point. Right, okay. So that gives, that gives I think that gives the red bicycle a little bit more credence. Mm. That's right, I think, yeah. It does. I read um, I read that the – because we've asked this so many times, that how come there were so many people in the area, so many people were around, how come nobody saw anything? And I read that the police – one of the police detectives, um, this Ed Tyne, I think his name is, he had developed this time chart that could – um, place somebody within the vicinity of when Sini went missing. And he said it's almost certain that people did see whoever it was, but they just didn't realize that it was that that person was the murderer. Um, mm-hmm. They've just, and they've just not, not thought anything about it. But actually, he believes that people did see, actually, in fact, see him at some point. I'm sure point. they did, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which to me would state that he's a person that would fit into the community or is yeah was known right Not, yeah like a, yeah exactly either it's somebody that's known to everybody that they think oh no he wouldn't do something like that it was just I don't know mm-hmm. Jimmy or whoever um, yeah. or it was somebody who was able to sort of blend in maybe see I'm thinking because he's so young I wonder if he would if there, is there a, a bigger school you know like a an older kids school there are so there okay. 
there's Jones Middle School, so he would have not he would not have fit in like with Jones Middle School. No. However, there's also the high school. There's Upper Arlington High School, which is uh, you know relatively nearby. So I don't yeah. think anyone would question if if there's a high school you know age yeah. kid in the area. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was just thinking because if it's more an of an adult place and a very young child place, perhaps mm-hmm. you know it would be a bit weird to see a young guy out with a bike or whatever. But if it's not and there's sort of a mix of all different ages, if they are colleges or there's high schools close-ish, then it wouldn't probably be too much of a problem that there's somebody walking about that you don't perhaps recognize. Yeah. Now, this witness that we just talked about said that she saw this man running with what appeared to be a child at 325 from Malvern, right? Yeah. However, we talked about the last known sighting of Sini at 320, Yeah, which would have been 10 minutes after she would have left the school. School. Yeah, that's right, because she didn't leave until 10 past, did she? That's correct. So yeah. would she have been able to get down to Malvern for an attack to occur and for mm. this this man to be seen running across the street within 15 minutes of leaving school, which I think is possible. Yeah. And five minutes of that last known sighting. Yeah. But perhaps, you see, perhaps the person that was seen carrying her um, – Perhaps they had only just, he had only just got to her. So it's possible, it's possible it could happen. Um, I don't think you can rule it out. You don't know, I don't know. You, I don't think you can rule it out. It's it's very interesting. Because so we, you know, I think yesterday we stated that in the autopsy, it appeared that she had possibly a broken nose. So yeah. was he able to, you know, attack, basically render her unconscious mm. and then run her across the street. So I read that the police police believe that what had happened to her is that he had um attacked her somewhere along Waltham Road um yes. on her way home from school and had taken her into um the clearing which is where he raped her in there's there's some pine trees there surrounded just off to the I think it's the left hand side on the way down Waltham as if she's going towards the culvert and they believe that in that clearing that is where he um that's where he raped her and then he took he carried her about 150 yards into the culvert and that's where he killed her yeah, I, 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 I can believe that, yes. That's what they're saying. And if that's the case, that kind of fits in with that woman that saw her a man carrying her further down because she's talking about it being around Malvern. So she would have seen, yeah. she could or could have seen, that could be where he's carried, picked her up and carried her down towards the yeah. culvert. And that would make sense. But then yeah. we've got all those witnesses that said that they didn't see anything in the culvert right up until like yeah. four, the brothers, um, 10 past four, West... Remember, they were down west side. They mm-hmm. put their bikes down yep. there, and they they didn't see anything down there. But that doesn't mean to say that she wasn't there. It's just that they didn't see her. I think from the time frame that we talked about yesterday, mm. this three twenty five to three thirty time that she possibly saw someone. Yeah, I kind of i I think I can believe that. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I think that's probably if if we were to break down hour by hour, minute to minute, that mm. probably would be the the time that would make the most sense. Yeah, because Sini's mom really didn't become concerned. We know she by three forty she was concerned. Yeah, right. So this yeah. is forty minutes after she she would have normally left school. Yeah. So by three twenty five. Or three thirty, no one was looking for her yet. No, that's right. And also, when you are doing like when you are remembering stuff, when you're looking back at things, you're it's not a completely accurate time. It's about you know I could tell it's you about. where I, where I was yesterday about a time, but I couldn't tell you dead on exactly what time I was I was there yesterday. So I think I think her 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 sort of timeline of things works out quite well with with what the police are thinking and what we mm-hmm. think might have happened. Yeah. And it's possible, too, if you think about it, it's possible, too, that while she says, OK, I saw him running from Malvern Road across the street, it easily could have been Hillside as well. Yeah, so exactly. Because you, you they be are really remembering close. the yeah. actual location of where you yeah. were when when this happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK. I don't dismiss it. 
No, definitely not. I don't think you can. No, I think you're right. I don't think you can dismiss it. Yeah. So now we're going to get to our second witness that came forward. Now, the problem with this witness is it, he does not set forward until a month after yeah. her murder. Yeah. Which makes me wonder why. Like, why? what took so long for them to step forward? Perhaps he wasn't in the, Perhaps he didn't know about it. I don't know if this was, was something that would have been all over the news. Perhaps he just didn't see it. Perhaps Possibly, it wasn't. You yeah. know, there's there's no social media back then. So perhaps, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to be relying on local news reports and newspapers. So perhaps he didn't actually see anything or, you know, then heard it a few weeks later and thought, oh, hang on a minute. I saw that. No, that can't be right. And then thought, oh, no, actually, I'm going to say something. So, yeah, possibly. yeah, I think nowadays with social media, everything's so instant. And I think we forget that back in 1980, there was nothing like that. There wasn't even mm-hmm. mobile That's phones. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so I can see why it would take so long for him to come forward. Yeah. So this witness was a maintenance man for the Association of Developmentally Disabled, mm-hmm. which was located on West Fifth Avenue. So not too far from uh, from this area. Uh, just Fifth Avenue, if you look at the map, it's really just south of of Walt- Waltham. Um, it's in, I think I believe it's the next intersection on Thirty Three um, okay. Riverside Drive. Right. Okay. Now. This witness stated that in late May, he observed a subject which matched a well-known composite. So by this point, a composite sketch had been put out in regards to their suspect. Right. Um, so he observed a, a – uh, he observed a man mm. that that resembled this composite on the steps of the Association of Development Dis- – Dis- Dis- I say that again – on the steps of the Association for the Dis- Development – on the steps of the association for the developmentally disabled. Okay. Uh, they stated that the subject was wearing blue running shoes, jeans, a tan jacket with elastic cuffs uh, around the, the waist and the wrist. And they stayed there for about two hours. Um, like a baseball now, jacket. Yeah. Like yes, a correct. bomber jacket. Yeah. Baseball jacket. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Um, he said that, n- that neither him nor any of his coworkers were able to identify him. Right. Now, a few days later, he was at another facility called the Adult Day uh, the Adult Day Service, which was on 3rd Avenue. Okay. Uh, that's also uh, relatively close. So of course, it's it's going to be south of 5th. Um, but they were having a party at this facility, at this Adult Day Service. And this, that same, same person, same man was there, but he was not participating in the event. Right. Okay. So he, he has seen this person twice. Now, on June 3rd, uh, this maintenance man went to the Railroad Savings and Loan on Arlington Avenue and North Malway Drive at 3.10 p.m. Okay. Uh, when he left, he drove down Waltham Road uh, towards 33 Riverside Drive. Yeah. Where he observed a red single-speed bike with a plastic star lying at the curb of a field. Across the street, he saw a subject carrying a girl towards towards a house. He felt this, he felt at this time that the girl had fallen off the bike, and her father or brother was carrying her uh, home. Ah, yeah, yeah. So then he later realized that the subject, or he later realized that the man was the the one that he had seen at the two assisted living facilities. Oh, okay. And that even though it, it was warm out, out that day, he had on the same jacket and jeans. Right. Okay. Busted. Yes. Now this man, um, the witness, then went on to a went to a restaurant on on thirty three where we started drive and stayed for about an hour and he left between four o'clock and four fifteen. Right. Um, on his way home, he once again saw this the man at Fifth Avenue and Broadview Avenue headed eastbound on a bike. Oh, so now he's on the bike. Yeah. Yeah, so he's on the bike. So he did not see this man again and told the police that they might want to check uh, the Arts and Crafts building at Kinnear and Ackerman Roads, but he never stated why. Now, my question about this is how much is this, of this information that it gave, uh, specifically about the bike, was that already in the news or not? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Whether actually he's heard this this. Uh, information already and then has come forward like he's a memory but actually it's not he's heard mm-hmm. it in the news possibly yeah it could be 
exactly. Because I think really that is the, well, there's two things, right? So the bike and then the man carrying a child. Mm. And that's a pretty good conclusion to jump to, that if you saw a bike pushed up against the side and you see a guy carrying a girl, it is possible that Mm -hmm. perhaps she's hurt herself and that he's carrying her in. So if he's going towards a house, you wouldn't really think, you know, unless she had blood on her or anything like that, you possibly wouldn't think anything of it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, The interesting thing is that he thought that he was carrying her towards a house, which would be, if you think about it, would be completely opposite to what the first witness had seen, right? Yeah. So the first witness would have seen a man carrying a child away from a house to a field. Yeah. And this sounds like she's, he saw a man carrying a child away from the field towards a house. To a house, yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Now, yeah. you know, I could be reading this wrong, so don't quote me on this, but it does sound like those two, even though that they're, they are talking about, you know, a man carrying a child, it sounds like they're two completely different things. Yeah. And she said he was running with the child and he didn't say he was running. So, mm, interesting. That is interesting. I don't, I don't know what I, what, what I think about this second witness. Yeah. Um, because once again, I can't verify what he had read or what he had heard prior yeah. to him stepping forward and talking to the police. Yeah. Because with these cases, um, I mean, he worked in the Upper Arlington area, so people had to in talking about it. I mean, even though we talked about, it, we don't know if he even knew about the case before he came forward. That's right. But I tend to think that if you work in this area, you, you know, the case. Yeah. Or at least you've heard something. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And this is one of those cases where I believe there was a lot of rumors going around. Yeah. So it's very possible that someone had heard, oh, there was a red bike or someone saw some, you know, a guy carrying a, a child. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So it's I, hard. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. No, that's hard, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are lots of different people that have come forward to say lots of different things. And I think if we were to di- dive into every single one of them, we would be here all day. Um, so yeah, we, yeah. we've kind of just sort of had a look through them and pulled out the most, what we what we consider to be the most in-depth and, and mm-hmm. sort of um, important ones. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult, yeah. isn't it? Because people are working on yeah. memory as well. And memory is not always, it's not always um, perfect. We don't have a perfect recollection of things as humans. Yeah, I think to wrap up these witnesses, mm. this is what I want to say, say about them, all right? So if we were to look at both witness one and witness two, I still say that witness one is 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 probably more reliable. Yeah, yeah. Because we're talking 12 hours. Yeah. Um, And she, at that point, uh, you know, there's no information out about no, the case, really. That's right, and I think I, I agree with you. I think hers is probably a better one to go from because his is like a month later. So I I agree with you. Yeah. And this guy is able to identify a man carrying a body. Yeah. Or carrying a child across, you know, going across the street, and he's able to to tell me that he's wearing the same jacket and same jeans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's not really I mean, I can't, anything new, is it? It's nothing new, really. Yeah. I mean, okay. I've seen people, this, I mean, talking about like this week, I've seen numerous people and I can't tell you what they were wearing. No. Like, like not just random people that I just pass on the street, like people that I know. Yeah. But I can't tell you what they're wearing. But he's able to tell me that, you know, two or three months ago, he saw this guy twice. He was wearing the same clothes. And then he saw him on the day of the murder a month, you know, a month before, and he's still wearing the same clothes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit, it's a bit more suspect that one. So I agree with you. I think the first one was the one I would probably go with, but obviously they have to go, they have to take everything, but yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned the composite and obviously this composite was, was made up of, this was from well, the witnesses or was this from previous, because we do know that there was, there was, there has been previous um, attacks or attempted attacks in the area. Um, yes, there are. Mm. Um, so the, if I am, if I'm not mistaken, so mm. the composite that we're talking about most recently is from 
the from the wit- first witness. Yeah. So okay. the witness that came forward on June fourth. He looks like Noel Gallagher from Oasis. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? I do. What was he doing? What was yeah. he doing in 1980? I want to know because because I wonder how old he would have been at that time. He looks it actually does look like a little bit like Noel Gallagher if you know who that is from Oasis. That's he does look a bit like him. It's a bit weird. The first thing as I saw it, I thought, whoa, okay. So you mentioned um, other attacks that had occurred around this time in which there were some other composites. Yeah. And yeah, so I think we should talk about these because there are definitely some that I feel could could be related. Yeah. So between roughly March 1980 and June 1980, there had been numerous attacks that had occurred in or around Upper Arlington. Yeah. Which possibly could be connected or it could have been the same suspect. Yes. The first one we're going to talk about occurred on March 16th, 1980 at approximately 5.15 p.m. Mm -hmm. There was a female victim who was running on the Ohio State University bike path west of Beavis Hall. So if you were to go east of Upper Arlington, you would actually hit Ohio State University. Oh, right. Okay. So this is basically, you know, this will be the border area from between Ohio State and Upper Arlington. Right. So this actual path is a path that cuts from North Star Avenue in Upper Arlington to Kenny Road and goes through a cornfield. Right. Okay. A white male suspect grabbed the victim as she ran by and choked her until she was unconscious. The victim woke up in a shallow pond 10 feet from the attack. No sexual assault was attempted. Uh, Witnesses saw a man running from the area to a bicycle and then ride westbound towards Kenny Road. Oh. The victim could not identify the suspect. A description was provided, presumably by one of the witnesses. Yeah. They described the the suspect as a white male, about 6'2", with a slim build, brown, black, wavy hair. He was wearing a long brown jacket, a flannel shirt, and dark pants. The bicycle was either brown or maroon in color. Right. Um, and they stated that the, that suspect did not see anything during the attack. Oh, Okay. So that's very similar, isn't it? That's, yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah it is very, very, very similar. That's very suspect. About a month later, this was on April 13th, uh, 1980, at 10.50 p.m., there was a female victim that was chased by a white male on 11th Avenue near Mack Hall. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information about that. I don't, with that that one, um, Ohio State is a huge, <laughs> huge campus, so that yeah. could really be anyone. Okay. So next we had, uh, I would go say the following day, but this is hours later. So this is on April 14th, 1980 at 6.20 a.m. Right. Now there was a, now this uh, female victim was walking on 12th Avenue near Baker Hall. So very, very close to Mack Hall and 11th Avenue. When she was grabbed by a, by a suspect uh, from behind with a knife. What? Uh, the victim scream and she and the suspects both fell to the ground. The suspect ran away and was chased by witnesses. He was described as a white male with olive complexion and had dark curly hair. Right. So that doesn't really fit in with the other witness things we've heard about this guy because the curly hair, that doesn't, and he's got Mm -hmm. like olive complexion. So maybe that one's not, it's just coincidence around the kind of same time. Yes. Okay. But this is where it kind of ties in. Okay. So right. those, if you were to take those by themselves, they don't tie in, okay? Yeah. So on April 15th, so yeah. this was 13th, 14th, now the following day, the 15th, a female victim was riding her bike eastbound on the Ohio State bike path past a white male suspect walking westbound. The suspect came up from behind the victim, pulled her from her bike, and began stabbing her. <gasps> victim received 15 stab wounds. The suspect then ran eastbound on the bike path. No sexual assault was attempted. He was described as being about 5'10", dark complexion, wearing a watch cap, and wearing a gold ring with a red stone on his left hand. Suspect said nothing during the attack. So let's go. I don't know. This is, this is a lot. So let's go, right? Let's go back to this. So you have a uh, – back in April, you have someone on a bike path who's attacked. Yeah. Okay. Um, who was on a bicycle. Yeah. Yeah. You have two attacks that don't seem to go along with, with everything else. Yeah. But then you go the following day, it once again happens on a bike path. Now we don't 
have any idea if he had a bike or not. No. But being on a bike path, I could see him possibly having a bike. See, this sounds to me like different people. This sounds to me like two different offenders at the same time. This sounds to me like one guy did a two of them and another guy did the other two. It sounds to me like they're different. I mean, especially with the whole olive mm-hmm. skin thing, that kind of thing is where yeah. it yeah, and, and I mean, they've not really mentioned how old this guy tends to to be because we've got the first witness of the um Cini's case saying that he was a young guy maybe early 20s the others um I haven't seen anything to say how old he was just that it was a white male or a olive complexion male doesn't actually say so much as to what what sort of age he was so I'm wondering whether this is just a coincidence that this is happening around the same sort of time as as Cini's I don't think this one guy has done all of these different. That's what I'm, that's what point I'm making. I don't think it's one person that's done all of this. Possibly. Perhaps it was two. Perhaps it was two blokes that were doing this, working together. Well, yeah. There's nothing to say that that is that that doesn't happen. This could be something that people are. You know, like people they try things before they actually go and do something because strangling somebody it's not like it is in in films if you are to strangle somebody um it's it takes a lot to strangle a human um perhaps obviously less with a child but it, it it's not a quick easy death and that makes me wonder whether the with Sini particularly whether that was um her actual killing the murder weapon was an opportunistic um killing because if he has grabbed her from behind and knocked her out, then obviously she's rendered unconscious. She's not defending herself. He then gets her to somewhere where she starts to struggle and perhaps trying to scream. And then he's panicking because he can't shut her up. And he just picks up the closest thing and and hits her um, to stop her. But I wonder if like, They've, I mean, listening to that guy is listening to the different guys there that are trying to grab people off the. You've got one that's got a knife. You've got one that's hit someone to the ground. No sexual attack. But with Sini, she was. We know she was raped. We know that there was there was that 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 happened. We know that there was a sexual assault. And I believe that there was another young girl who was also raped, but she wasn't killed. Um, now she was a young girl, the same sort of roughly the same age as Sini in the same area, but she wasn't actually killed. And she was hit from behind on the head and rendered unconscious. So she actually didn't see her attacker, but she didn't die. That is correct. That so is correct. this sounds to me like there's two different, it's two different MOs. There's two different mm-hmm. people, I think. Hold on to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you did mention a another attack mm-hmm. and that's what we're going to get to next. So that happened on May 7th. 1980 at 4 yeah. p.m. So this is uh, just just under a month before Sini's attack and murder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, this occurred on Canterbury Lane. So it was a white female victim who was nine years old. Oh, man. She was grabbed by a subject in some bushes at the rear of her home as she was walking home from school. Oh, so same as Sini. Exactly. He yeah. punched and choked a victim unconscious and had her pants down. At some point, the subject was scared off by barking dogs next door. Before fleeing, he may have thrown one of her shoes approximately 55 feet away. He was described as a white male, aged 18 to 20, with pale olive complexion. He was wearing a brown jacket with elastic on the collar and the cuffs, brown gloves, brown shoes, blue jeans, and said nothing during the attack. Okay, so that sounds very similar to the other mm-hmm. to, to some of the other attacks doesn't it it does so they've got an absolute nutcase on the loose in upper arlington by the sounds of things at this time i would say absolutely yes so this is a month about a month before Sini's murder so this was like this was like a te- maybe a test run or maybe this was like his first attempt so prior to this may 7th attack yeah. he attacked he was going after girls who were at Ohio State, Ohio State students, right? Right. So you're talking girls that are probably between the ages of 18 and 22, something like that, right? Yeah. I'm thinking that he found that he had difficulty controlling I agree older with you. women. Yeah, I agree with you. So he goes and says, okay, well, I can't I can't get this college girl, right? They, they fight me off. Yeah. So I have to go after something that I can control. Yeah. And that's when he goes after... Younger. younger victims. I agree with you. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah. 
Now, there's one other attack or attempted attack that occurred roughly a week prior to Sini's murder. So this ca- happened on May 28th. Now, there was a woman who was about 25 years old who was who had reported that she was being followed on Ashbury Drive, uh, which is approximately just over a half mile from from Canterbury Lane, where the May 7th attack occurred. Yeah. yeah. By a white male on a bicycle. Oh, again. At the time, there was a suspect who was stopped and interviewed in the area who was wearing a dark blue T-shirt and blue jeans. Ooh, okay. So we've got two suspects, haven't we? There's two suspects that we are concentrating on. There are. When you look at this case, these are the two main suspects. And really, they're the most likely okay. suspects. What's crazy is they both went to Upper Arlington High School. No. So is this something that they're doing together? You said. I did, didn't I? Like I a mean, tactic. You said maybe it's yeah. two people together. Some people think it's it's a possibility that they may have been working yeah. in tandem and that it's possible that one suspect had power over the other suspect and was kind of grooming yeah. that suspect. Like influencing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. When you, when you mention it, when you explain it like that, that makes a lot of a sense with all these different kind of attacks that we're getting, the different styles that we're getting, the slightly different appearance mm-hmm. that we're getting. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have slightly different appearances. And I think at this point, I think they were trying to figure out what worked. Exactly. What, what works for that? Exactly. You've got the strangling, you've got the stabbing, you've got the smacking over the head and rendering mm-hmm. unconscious, you've got the punching in the face, but they're both not sexual. One seems to be sexually motivated. The other one tends not to be, be so much. violent. It exactly. is more violent. Angry. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the, the one where the victim was stabbed, that was violent. Not that was, 15 that was, stab wounds. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That was, there was anger in that. Definitely. And there was no sexual assault with it. It was just yeah. stabbing. Not even not even attempted sexual assault. It's just stab and go. Mm-hmm. I think we're at the point where we, we need to start talking about suspects. Definitely. So, like I said, we have two suspects that we're going to talk about. So, our first suspect, suspect number one, was a 20-year-old man named Brent Strutner. Okay. He graduated from Upper Arlington High School in 1979 and spent a good portion of his childhood in a home that was about a half mile away from Tremont Elementary. Now, Tremont Elementary is the school that the victim of the the May attack went right. to. Okay. So he was from the from the area. Right. So at the time of Sini's murder, Brent lived just outside of Upper Arlington in an apartment building on Independence Road. So close. Yeah. So about a mile and a half from the corner of Waltham and Hillside. Okay. And it's said that he did exhibit some violent behavior in the days before Sini's murder. No, oh dear. Okay. So yeah. it's not looking good for him. It's not. No. Um, now, on May 30th, 1980, he was involved in al- altercation with Grandview Heights police. Um, oh. Grandview Heights is another suburb, which is basically directly south of Upper Arlington. Right. I, I mentioned earlier Fifth Avenue and Third. So if you were to take Fifth or Third East, that's Grandview. So really, it's like Grandview, and then it goes in the Upper Arlington. Okay. So on May 30th, he was arrested after police officers responded to a call that a man was acting strangely and breaking glass on the street. Okay. When police arrived, it was about 9.30 in the morning, uh, it stated in the report that Brent had leaped and crawled over a moving car that was going about 15 miles an hour trying to escape from the police. Oh, okay. They ended up chasing Brent and a fight ensued before he was able to be taken into custody. Okay. So police said they had to work about five minutes to control him, who was kicking and swinging his arm and screaming when being, while being arrested. So he was completely Angry. just out of his yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. Totally. He was charged with one count of resisting arrest, two counts of assault on a police officer, and one count of marijuana position. He became a suspect, or he became a person of interest to Upper Arlington police because of of unusual behavior the night of the murder. So the night of June 3rd, Brent and some of his friends visited a bar near Ohio State. Yeah. And while there, he was seen weeping or crying. Uh. He told the other bar patrons that he was afraid to go home. When his friends took Brent home that night, 
he stated that he did not want to enter his, his residence because he was afraid that they were after him. Who? We don't know. Who, we oh, don't you don't know. know who? He oh, just okay. said that they're after me. Shortly after this event, Upper Arlington police learned about his behavior through an anonymous phone call. Right. Okay. After he was identified as a person of interest, various witnesses did come forward to give information about his whereabouts on the day of Sini's murder and potentially where he was at the time of the May 7th attack. Right. One witness stated that on June 3rd, they saw Brent um, in Upper Arlington at approximately 3 p.m. So it would be around the time that Sini went, went, went missing? That that is correct. Right. That okay. Correct. Yeah. Um, Upper Arlington police later claimed that a witness may have seen him in the immediate vicinity of Waltham um, Hillside in Malvern Roads. And he does, looking at the picture of him, he does look like the composite sketch. He does. He does yes, look he like does. it. He does fit in really mm-hmm. well with that with that composite sketch. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, there was an auxiliary Franklin County Sheriff's deputy who spotted a man on the service road that goes into the first community village at yeah. approximately 2.10 p.m. on the date of, of Sini's murder. Right. Now, when Upper Arlington police provided this deputy group of photographs, he picked out Brent's picture oh. as most resembling the man he saw on the service road. Okay. Not looking good for Brent now. It is not. No. Once again, after Brent was identified, the Upper Arlington Police Department shared photographs of him with witnesses from the May 7th attack, notably the girl who was actually attacked on May 7th, as well as the friend who was with her minutes before the attack. Yeah. Now, they gave both of them um, a group of 10 photographs of men to look at. Yeah. And they both stated that that Brent's picture was most like the person they had seen shortly before the attack. Oh, okay. So it's definitely not looking good for Brent now. He's looking really suspicious. He is looking extremely suspicious. Yeah. Suspicious. Extremely yeah. suspicious. Okay. So he also attracted interest from the police department because of the red 10-speed bicycle seen near the crimes on May 7th and uh, and June 3rd. Right. So Upper Arlington police noted that Brent had been known to ride a 10-speed bicycle, which matches the descriptions of one seen by witnesses. Of course it does. More specifically, friends of Brent told police that he owned a red 10-speed bicycle that he quit riding immediately after the assault of May 7th. Huh. Well, that's suspect. Yes, it is. Well, obviously, it kind of sounds like Maybe he did write it after May 7th if he was involved yeah. in Sini's murder. Yeah, but maybe he only, maybe he didn't do it as much as, as he was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, another one of Brent's friends stated that they noticed his bike in, in another friend's garage. And Brent said that he did not want to ride it anymore. So this was a day after Sini's murder. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. After police became interested in Brent, he ended up fleeing the area. Okay. Prior to him leaving, police did learn that Brent visited a friend's home on June 5th. Right. And while there, peered out the window stating, are the cops coming? And if the cops don't quit hassling me, I'm going to kill them. Oh, that's not good. And then he stated when leaving his friend's home that I got to get out of here. They're going to bust me. So, yeah, he's very paranoid. And obviously we know that mar- marijuana is a, it's a, it is a depressive drug and it does. There's quite a lot of people that do. It, it's linked to schizophrenia and that kind of thing. And that sounds to me like he's obviously got issues. There's obviously something yes. mentally that is he's it sounds like a very disturbed guy. Um, and so to me, he sounds like the more I don't know whether he's more the angry like the angry side of this or whether he's more the sexual side of this at the moment, to be honest. I haven't made my mind up if, on that yet. If we're talking about two, if we're talking about two separate yeah. suspects or, yeah. or, or, yeah, if uh, we're talking about the two, the two se- yeah, two separate attackers, which I think, I think that's um, what it is. I think I see him as being violent. Yeah. I, I, I saying, I think he's the angry one because we already know yeah. that the days leading up to Sini's murder, he was already, he was already seen you know, behaving aggressively. So to me, I wonder mm. if the, he is, I'm wondering if he's the aggressive one out of this, out of this. I think it's two people. That's what I keep coming back to. I think it's two different people, that, but they seem to be linked somehow. And so I think with this, he seems to be the more aggressive 
of all these attacks that we've had and he seems to be mm -hmm. giving out that kind of um that kind of behavior yeah yeah interesting no, right yeah now maybe when i continue here mm -hmm. you, maybe you'll you'll start thinking yeah he is the violent one the the aggressive one okay okay so after that night so on june 5th after he was at his friend's house being paranoid saying you know cops are you know the cops coming etc at 11 p.m. that night, he returned to his home, his parents' home near Tremont Elementary, and took his parents' car. He then drove north towards the Cleveland, Ohio area. Right. And there he started to exhibit more violent and unusual behavior. Yeah. Okay. On June 6, 1980, at about 7.45 a.m., police officers found Brent stranded in an automobile in Willoughby, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Right. When police officers approached his car, he closed the windows and began stabbing himself in the groin with a loaded hypodermic syringe. What? Okay. So police officers were forced to break the window in order to subdue him. Yeah. And they ended up scuffling with him outside the car. And then again in the police station when they tried to move him for, uh, to a holding cell. Yeah. This is not um, They stated yeah. that he was acting wild like he was on drugs or something and he put up quite a physical battle. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think he's got some sort of mental illness. Yeah, I think so. He was once again charged with attacking police, resisting arrest, disorderly conduct, and illegal position of a hypodermic needle. Right. Okay. We don't have any idea of what the actual no. contents of that needle were. Yeah, luckily. Luckily he didn't stab anyone else with it. Mm -hmm. After Upper Arlington police learned that Brent had been arrested and was in custody up in Willoughby, they drove up to interview him about Sini's murder. Right. Now, detectives did not mention why they were going to question him. But when they arrived, he immediately said that he didn't hurt anyone. <laughs> so, yeah, straight away, he's just dropped himself right in mm -hmm. it. Yeah, okay. They questioned him for about two hours on June 8th, 1980. Right. And he apparently did agree to take a polygraph test. But then later on advice of a, of his attorney, he refused to yeah, take think, the test and stop talking to police. I think that's a good idea because I don't think he's he's mentally sound enough to be speaking and doing mm -hmm. a polygraph test. I don't think they'll be able no. to take that. So with this, Upper Arlington police did actually obtain a sample of his blood. Right. And they also obtained a search warrant for his apartment where they confiscated a pair of white tennis shoes, a pair of red corduroy pants, a white washcloth containing brownish stains, Ugh. a short sleeve shirt, and hair samples. Wow. Okay. Now these items, uh, these items that were conf that were confiscated, were sent to the FBI for testing. Right. Now the tests were performed on the blood and other items. This did not lead to an indictment, so we don't really know what the results were. I don't know what the outcome was. Right. Okay. Interesting. Around the same time, Upper Arlington police did note that while Brent was a suspect, he was one of as many as 15 people being investigated at that time. Okay. But let's be honest, he's pretty suspect at this point. Yeah. Okay. So with Brent, uh, he did go to trial for his his assault on police and resisting arrest. Yeah. And he ended up pleading not guilty by reasons of insanity. Oh, God. Okay. He did admit that he, he did use illegal drugs and suffered from occasional hallucinations, paranoia, and sometimes yeah. was believed furniture was moving into the apartment or doors refused to open for him. Yeah. Something is not quite right there, is it? So basically, he discussed his history of domestic unrest, mental instability, and drug abuse. So, Yeah, I think that's pretty obvious that was coming. So he eventually, for this, he eventually did reach a plea bargain on his charges. Yeah. Um, so because of this plea bargain, he was sentenced six months in jail. Oh, no. Okay. So after his six months, he did... Back out. He was sent back to Columbus. Yeah. And was sentenced to for his the incident with Grandview Police. The second one, yeah. To yeah, ninety days in jail. But forty five of those got suspended. <laughs> okay. Uh contingent on him receiving mental health counseling. Right. And paying Grandview Heights police for damaged property. Right, okay. So he really didn't get very much overall. Yeah. So we're talking really twenty days. seven yeah. seven and a half months in jail. Right. Okay. 
prosecutors did acknowledge that he did receive a relatively light sentence for his Grandview Heights incident. Yeah. yeah. So, he, yeah. So he got 45 days in, for Grandview Heights, but then six months for Willie, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> yeah, the same thing. Same right? thing. Yeah. So I would say that Brent really received the the most amount of media atten- attention. Right. So his name was plastered all over the Columbus Dispatch, a local newspaper. And because of that, his father ended up suing the Columbus Dispatch for invasion of privacy. Right. Okay. It, this did go to trial and both the trial court and the appellate court ruled against Brent's father in favor of dispatch. So yeah. while dispatch did go, go out and name him as a suspect and basically report on whatever information they had on him. Yeah. Court stated that it was not an invasion of, of privacy. No, it's just like a report of facts, really, isn't it? Okay. Now, on June 4th, 1984, so this is roughly four years, just over four years after Sini's death, Brent Strutner committed suicide. Oh, no. Okay. okay. At this time, Brent was staying at the downtown Columbus YMCA. Right. And police received a call at about 4 a.m., on June 8th, stating that a new body was lying on the sidewalk on the front street side of the YMCA. Detectives had stated that Brent had been staying alone in a sixth floor room on that side of the building. And when they went to go into their to his room, they said that the door was locked and the window was open. Mm. Now, the night before he committed suicide, Brent did have a final run in with Upper Arlington Police. OK. According to the UA Police Department, um, relatives of Brent had called the police at about 6 p.m. on June 7th, 1984, because they wanted him out of their house. Right, okay. So Upper Arlington medics and a Upper Arlington police officer accompanied Brent to a hospital. And then later, after a brief stay at that hospital, he was taken to the YMCA by a member of his family. Yeah. And, of course, Brent was found dead early the next morning. Is I mean, it's, this guy's obviously got serious... It, it's sad, really. I mean, he's obviously got serious mental issues and mm-hmm. he obviously hasn't got had the help that would f- to fix this. And I think yeah. I think there's a lot going on there. I do. I definitely think he's involved. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. sad. So we'll never know, really, obviously, because he committed suicide. So we're never going to know for definite as to whether yeah. he was involved or not. But I mean, from what, what we know. I don't think he does have an alibi. No. I mean, you would think that if he did, it would be it would be in the reports, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be in the police reports, and we've we've got nothing to say that it's, he's been ruled out as a suspect. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. Right. So we can't rule him out. I'm not allowing it. We cannot. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> he's not being ruled out. Okay, Cherry. So that is suspect number one. Mm-hmm. Now let's move on to suspect number two. Another total weirdo. Yes, to say the least. Now, this suspect came onto the radar roughly four months after Sini's murder. Right. He became a prime uh, suspect initially for the May 7th, 1980 attack, which occurred on Canterbury Lane. Right. His name is Robert Chris Winchester. Uh, He goes by Chris, so we will refer to him as Chris or suspect number two. Yeah. He became a suspect in both Sini's murder as well as the attack on Canterbury Lane mm. after a abduction of a 13-year-old girl near the Olentangy Commons complex on September 27, 1980. Oh. So before we get into that, let's go ahead and give you a little information on him, okay? Okay, yep. Like Brent, suspect number one, he was a graduate of Upper Arlington High School. He graduated in 1978, so the year before suspect number one, Brent Strutner. So at the time, he was six foot one uh, and roughly about 195 pounds, and he actually lived on the same road as where Brent's childhood home was on Kent Road in Upper Arlington. Yeah, so they were actually friends, and they knew each other, and we would later come to find out that they would actually go to places like Frankenstein's Cave to do drugs together. So this is where our tag team theory could possibly come to fruition then. They knew each other. They knew each other more than just like, Mm -hmm. oh, morning, like more than that kind of neighbors. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. And then they were they were friends. So we said that before that we thought that Brent was the more um, angry one. He obviously had the psychological problems and was more the angry one. So that would mean then that Richard or Chris or whatever mm-hmm. he's called, he is the more the sexually motivated 
weirdo. Yeah, when we kind of go over the September 1980 attack, it yeah. seems like maybe it is more sexually oh. involved. And that explains then the two different types of these attacks that keep happening. Yeah, yeah, so, like, I, something, yeah. I would say so, yeah. Oh, yeah, God, exactly. what an arsehole. That's awful. So Chris and Brent, they actually live about six houses apart on, on Kent Road in Upper Arlington, which is about a half mile from where uh, Sini was murdered. Yeah. He had some unusual behavior leading up to the September 1980 attack, which made the Upper Arlington police departments uh, aware of him. So they were aware of him up uh, as early as May 1980. So before, way before Sini was murdered. Well, no, a month so, yeah, about a month before yeah. Sini was murdered, yeah. Yeah. So they were aware of him. So it wasn't like a few days. That's interesting. That's correct. Because mm. we talked about the woman who complained to police about a man following her on Ashbury Lane. Yeah, yeah. On the 10-speed bike. Yeah. So that man was actually our suspect number two. That was Chris Winchester. No way. It was. So right? also, he's got access to that bike, the same as Brent had the access to that bike. So this could be the same bike that they're both using. It absolutely could be. Yeah. So the woman who made that complaint about the man being following her on the 10 speed bike identified that man as Chris Winchester. Oh, no. Busted. Upper Arlington police did question him about the incident, but oh. ended up not lodging any charges against him. Why? Because he didn't do anything that was. Oh, really I suppose he just followed the up. law. Yeah, I suppose. Besides yeah. being creepy and smiling yeah. creepily at her. Unfortunately, there's no law against that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was just being a creep, and so they said, "Okay, you got it. You you can go." Oh, that's crazy. Where all this is happening is like within a less than a mile radius. Yeah. Yeah. Now, after Sini's murder. Chris was one of the many suspicious persons that were listed in police files. Right. And that detectives that ended up questioning in regards to the murder. Oh, okay. Apparently, he passed a polygraph test that was related to his whereabouts on June 3rd, 1980, the, the, the day of Sini's murder. I don't trust polygraphs, but yeah. Well, no. In, in this case, uh, later on, his polygraph results were examined mm. by a outside source who reviewed them and said that there was deception. Yes. Yeah. The thing is with the polygraph test, I think if you were to be arrested for the murder, say you were arrested for the murder and the rape of a young child, you would be bloody nervous. And to go into a room where you've got police examined, I mean, even if you didn't do it, surely those nerves are going to show up in your in your polygraph. So I would just be dubious of the fact that you could incriminate yourself even if you did nothing wrong. So I don't always think that they're a great and they're not they're normally admissible and not admissible in court anyway. So what's you know what's the point in taking them? They you can't they won't stand up in court. So what's the point? Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm. So with this, they did continue to interview him. They did ask him general questions about his activities on the day of the murder. And from his answers, the police really could not check his story, but still gave him a tentative clearance. Ugh. But he was still placed on a list of persons and were willing to take another look at him if, if any, any anything else came up. Oh, good. Which I think, but we're willing, willing to take a look if anything else comes up. I would say I would keep him as, as to, suspect yeah. number one. Definitely. Well, not in, well, a, a main suspect. Yeah. Well, I think purely because we already know that Brent was, you know, Brent obviously by this point had, had committed suicide. So we're not going to get any more information from him. But seeing as these two knew each other and the amount of random attacks and these attacks that actually are similar in, in they're different, but they're the two sets are similar. I would sort of kind of question the fact that this is this is going on. And then she and then she dies. Um, and to me, it just I don't know how he just seems really fishy. Like I would not put him on a possible suspect list. He would be right up there with my definitely maybes. Yeah. And then let's hop into this abduction on yeah. September 27th, 1980. And I would say that after this, he would absolutely be suspect, the prime suspect. Yeah. He'd yeah. be the guy that I am completely focusing on. Okay? okay. Yeah. So once again, on September 27th, 1980, Robert Chris Winchester abducted a 13-year-old girl near the corner of Jason Way Avenue and Knightsbridge Boulevard at approximately 4.20 p.m. So he actually, so it's proven that he abducted her? Yes. Oh, my God. This went to trial. No. He found guilty. He served time in prison for this abduction. Yes. 
Oh, so yes, he would be suspect, definitely suspect number one for Sini's murder then. Yeah, which is crazy because when we talked about suspect number one, yeah, Brent Strutner, he was absolutely had to have been it, right? Well, the thing is, I do honestly think these two, I, I would have him as like a main suspect because of the similarity in this other yeah. one. So these two they together. They would be 1A, yeah, 1B. 1B, exactly. That I would, I would have had them both in as a, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this was a, a Saturday at 4.20 p.m. Yeah. Less than four months after the, the murder of Sini. Oh. Uh, Chris was arrested by Columbus police on the basis of a license plate number taken by three women who saw <gasps> a young male drag the 13-year-old from her bicycle on Jason Way Avenue, no west way. of the Olin Tangy Commons apartment com- complex. Uh, the women said that the man was attempting to force the girl into a wooded area when they ran screaming, screaming to her aid. He then fled in an automobile. 13. One of the women reported the license plate number of the car and gave it gave it in description of the man to the police, who traced the license to a car owned by Chris Winchester's mother. Oh no! Now this intersection, when we're talking about Olentangy Commons, Jason Way, Ninth Bridge, this is just outside of Upper Arlington. Oh no! Did and he, yeah, did he plead guilty to this, or did he do not guilty? Do we know? I know he was found guilty, but I wonder what he pleaded. No, he pled innocent, and this went to trial. Ah. Oh. Yeah, I bet he did. Because there's oh. no way you can try this, right? No. Well, he wasn't just dragging her. It wasn't dragging her off her bike to give her some sweets, was he? He was obviously up to no good. <laughs> no. So yeah, exactly. If he could do that to her, then what's saying that mm-hmm. you know a couple of months later he didn't do that to Sini, but then he actually got exactly. got her where he wanted her this time. Mm-hmm. So yep, exactly. Did did they test? Did they test? Because we've got the pubic hair for this. Did they test that? And and him. Th- they did, but they tested, they they found the pubic hair to be similar to his. <gasps> but you oh. remember, this is 1980. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they're not doing, no, they're not actually no. doing DNA testing. No. So they, they just studied, you know, they looked under a microscope or whatever and said, okay, these are very similar in composition. But now we've got DNA. So why don't, why don't they go back now and do it to prove absolutely that it was him? That's a big question. We don't know what they have left. No, I suppose one tiny little hair, I suppose there's only so much you can do with that before, mm-hmm. you know, every time you do it, it degrades it slightly, doesn't it? So, yep. mm. exactly. Oh, wow. No, so let's here. So let's talk about this crime that happened on September 27th in Sini's and kind of look at the similarities between the two. Well, first, yeah. the obvious one is they were both young girls. Mm. Okay. They both happened either in Ar- 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 Arlington or just outside of it so this, like, like i said this is just north of upper arlington they both happen mid-afternoon so sometime between 3 30 and 4 30 p.m right okay both girls were near their homes when the attacks occurred Ugh. on the september 27th attack chris passed the victim before attacking her so uh, he passed her turned around and went, and to went grab back oh uh. yeah now if we go back to that may 7th attack the yeah. one where the girl got away in April. Yeah, that's right. Once again, she that attacker also grabbed her from behind. Yeah, he did, didn't he? And it seems like Sini was attacked from behind. That's right. On May 7th, this is the Canterbury Lane attack, the attacker moved the victim to a forested area. Oh. Chris, on the 27th, moved the victim to a yeah. wooded area. See, there's too many similarities in it, but then I suppose it's proven it. But there are a lot of similarities in these two, like these two abductions. Wow. There are. Mm. Now, let me tell you something else, which is going to make you go, what? Okay. So you remember we talked about some attacks that occurred around Ohio State and yep. around Ohio State bypass? Yep. And I told you that on on April 27th, 1980, there was a man who was interviewed on a bike path mm. and was appeared oh, to be yeah. nervous. Yep, yeah, I remember. No. That man was Robert... Chris Winchester. No. That's crazy. Yeah. This guy is a piece of work. He is. So you're talking about someone who was charged and found guilty of abducting a young girl. A man who was interviewed in the area of other attacks months before. Somebody else has picked him out saying he was smiling creepily at them on a bike path. On a red bike. Mm. Yeah. You have a red bike that that is that appears in uh, at the time of Sini's murder. 
how much more can you how much more can you need you know it's crazy please tell me he hasn't committed suicide he has not committed suicide so robert chris winchester is still alive and still living in the columbus area oh no wait he's, so he's not in prison he is not in <gasps> prison oh no In January 1981, a jury of seven women and five men found Robert Chris Winchester guilty of abducting the 13-year-old girl. Yeah. He was facing between three to ten years in prison. Right. He asked the court for either shock probation or a reduced sentence. Now, shock probation is basically where you, you send someone to prison for a short period of time, say 90 days, Mm. and then... Afterwards, you re-sentence them to like probation with the hopes that them spending that short amount of time in jail would be enough to deter them from doing any other crime. Uh, no. No, I don't think yeah. so. I don't think that's... Yeah. No. I thought you were going to say something like electric shock therapy then. And I was going to say he needs it. He needs electric shock therapy. <laughs> yeah. He needs stringing up. He needs, he needs to go yeah. to Texas. That's where he needs to go. Send him to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> that's where he needs to go. They'll sort him out. Wow. Oh, no way. So oh. The assistant Franklin County prosecutor argued against both shock probation and sentencing, a Good. sentencing cut Good. based on the fact that, that he was a clear danger to the community. Definitely. Definitely. And so with that, his request for a liar sentence was denied. Good. Please tell me he was in prison for a long time. He was in prison from January 1981 until December 1983. Oh, no. Do the math in your head. I just did. That's not long enough. Mm -mm. He got the minimum sentence. Oh, my. What was the judge thinking that day? Obviously, he was tired and wanted to get things out of the way. That's ridiculous. I know. Well, here's the thing. So when he was sentenced, it was sentenced solely for this one act. Oh, God. Easy. He obviously had a good lawyer, didn't he? Yeah. Something. No way. So he ended up... uh, So after he was released in December, he was on parole until January 1985. Oh, that's so bad. Okay. Like I said, he still lives in Columbus. He, he has a house in the Franklinton area, and he has been living there since roughly 1993. I hope he's not married. So I, I don't know. I don't know about his, his marital status, but he did have like one other run-in with a, with police, which wasn't really a, a major incident. So he was charged with a res- resisting arrest and disorderly conduct in October 1994. So he was found guilty about the disorderly conduct, but the charges for re- resisting arrest ended up being dropped. And besides that, um, outside of you know traffic related incidents, he has not had any any other inc- incidents with the law. I can't believe that. I can't believe that somebody like that would would carry out stuff like that and then just stop. I mean, he was proven and pleaded mm-hmm. guilty to grabbing a thirteen year old kid off of their bike and trying to drag them into the woodland area. Mm-hmm. You're not telling yeah. me that that that's gonna that that just goes away. No, that's yeah. no, that's no good. Oh well, here, listen to this. So in 2002, he tried he tried to have that conviction sealed. Oh, so no one. So could he find wanted out to be awesome. sealed so no one could find out. That was that yeah, was good. denied by the court. Good. Yeah, good. Okay. And I'm gonna tell you one more crazy thing about Chris Winchester. Okay. I don't think they could be I don't think they could be more. Well, listen to this. So in two thousand eight, Chris was a, a team member on a project that was assembled to develop a community safe route to schools travel plan. <laughs> you are joking. No. Oh, that man has got some balls. He really has. To inject yourself into a safer community thing after being convicted and going to prison for snatching a 13-year-old kid. What were those people even thinking? I don't even think they knew. I doubt they, they even looked into his background. Well, do they not do checks for that kind of thing? I don't know. Obviously unless not. They were, unless they, <laughs> unless they, they thought, okay, maybe this is the type of guy we need on, on this yeah. team. <laughs> yeah. This guy knows <laughs> yeah. what it's like to be a creeper and how to yeah. protect children. Yeah, he's going to say, no, don't do that because that's easy. I'm going to be able to do this. So, oh, what a weirdo. What a nut job. If you're listening yeah. to this, Chris, you are an asshole. <laughs> yeah, so there. <laughs> that's that's my opinion. What a nasty yeah. man. What a nasty guy. God. So unbelievable. And you know what? I mean, I don't think we need, there's no need, I think, at this point to even like look at any other suspects. I no. mean, no. He would no. I mean, I, mean I, th- I think, I think the same. I think he would be just, just purely because of the previous, you know, the his previous. He's got form mm. for this, and th- oh, I just 
this is just crazy in such a small area as well. It's not a big area. You know, the radius, like you say, no. is not big. And oh, I just I can't believe that Sini's murder is still is still unsolved because of this. But then it must be so frustrating for the police because they've got all this and he's got form, but there's just not the enough evidence to actually charge him with it. So, you know, the probability is that it's him, but it's actually proven it in a court of law. And and unfortunately, there isn't enough to prove it. Yeah. Oh, man. But yeah, you know, let's really quickly talk about, once again, our thought that it could be two different people. Yeah, I do. And I th- yeah, and I think that's why I think that's why Brent, Brent ended up doing what he did to himself because I think he was very guilty for what he had done. Mm -hmm. So if we were to, if we had the idea that one was violent Mm. and one was sexually motivated, I think we have it down. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very violent. Yeah. And it seems like to me, because I mean, if we just look at the September 27th, okay, we do May 7th and in September 27th. I think those, well, we know September 27th was Chris. Yeah. May 7th. I think it was Chris, right? Because yeah. we know that yeah. the attack was very similar to, to Sini's. She was pulled out and, you know, pulled into a wooded area. Hmm. There was an attempted rape. God. And on September 27th, he was pulling her into the woods. I think that was going to be attempted rape as well. Definitely. So we can say, yeah. yeah. Absolute fact September 27th was Chris Winchester. May 7th, I think, is Chris Winchester. Okay. Hmm. Going back to the Ohio State ones, I, I think it is a mix between the two. Because we have the, yeah, the one agree. victim that was that was stabbed fifteen times. Yeah, that seems like it would, would have been Brent. that would have been Brent. Yeah. yeah. Now let's when we get to Sini. Sini, you ha- you do have a rape, mm. which would point to Chris. Chris, but yeah. then you have have her bludgeoned. Yeah, and I think that is where we get to Brent. I think that's what happens. Mm-hmm. I think we go. I think, and I think I wonder if that's why it was easy between the two because you know sh- witnesses have seen one guy, but then if he was already down by that by that culvert. You know, that could have been a two-person thing, you know? You don't know. It could have been, yeah. It could be. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, poor, now we we did Sydney. see just one bike, right? We saw one bike, no. but who says that one can't be on foot or whatever. Exactly. But mm. I do have this feeling that it might have been both of them. Yeah, they I do too. They might have been both there. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I think out of the two, I think that Chris is the stronger out of the two. I think he is he is possibly the dominant one and then you've got mm-hmm. you've got Brent who is the one that's slightly manic and yeah. and I think yeah I, that's what I think I think they they've been on drugs together they've come up with this idea he can't contain his guilt and he can't contain the paranoia that's going on in his mind so he kills himself but Chris is ever so slightly more calculated and dominant and I think maybe yeah. you know that's crazy and then I mean he's got to he's got to have issues when for in a past like that to then go and insert yourself into a safer communities group even if you didn't murder her just having that behind you even if you didn't you know abduct and rape that girl it, i wouldn't even go and try and get you'd want to stay away from people because you wouldn't want people knowing what you had done yeah oh. no yeah absolutely wow no yeah and so I, I i think this is how i look at it right and i think you're right i think chris is a more dominant one i think that he was using his influence over Brent mm. to kind of groom him. Yeah, definitely. Not to say that Brent wouldn't have done this on his own or anything like this on his own, but I think those two together, they just, it's like very similar people. Mm. They're kind of like, okay, they're kind of like um, the Columbine trainers, right? Yeah, yeah. Eric and, and Dylan. Yeah. Where I don't know, I, I think they played off each other. Yeah. They played off, they both had weak strengths and weaknesses and they both kind of played their role. Yeah. I think that would be similar to to these two. To these two. I think they're bad enough on their own, each one of them, but together, mm-hmm. you know, they're even worse. Yeah. What a shame. What I mean, it's heartbreaking, really. This is a heartbreaking case, and it's sad for Sini's family. It's so close to her home. You know, she was almost home. The way she was killed was horrific. You know, the fact that the last moments of her life were absolutely horrific, it just must be horrendous to have to deal with. And the fact that knowing that somebody like this is now free and walking about the streets and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, it's just mad, Mm -hmm. isn't it? It's crazy. I think we need, we're at this point where it's like, okay, what is it going to take to solve Mm -hmm. Sini's murder? I think we need, well, first off, Hopefully there is still some DNA or some stuff that can be tested. Oh, I hope so. I think that's, that's what it's going to take. Yeah. You know, we have at least one pubic hair. I don't know if there's anything left of it or how what they've done with it, but yeah, something needs to be tested. 
I wonder if um, I wonder if Brent was buried or whoever he was cremate, cremated, because if he was buried, mm-hmm. there's chances that you could still do DNA testing on his body. But yeah. if he was cremated, you got no chance. So yeah, you could you could still do yeah, testing on yeah. you know close even close family close family yeah like a parent a or or, or like a yeah. brother or something yeah. yeah yeah we know that um Chris is still alive so yeah it'd be easy to test him and of course like he should be a registered sex offender if he's not right so definitely. I think we yeah. should have something on him yeah. in the system he should definitely be being watched I think he should still be because of the seriousness of the crime that he committed he should be still yeah. under some sort of radar I hope that he is mm-hmm. I hope that they are still keeping an eye on him wherever he is because he's obviously a very dangerous man yeah yeah exactly no I completely agree in this one there is a whole lot of information out there in regards to mm. this murder and then um, of course our sus- suspects um, I want to thank uh, the people at the Long Walk Home, which is a um, it's a community group of uh, former Upper Arlington graduates, people from the area who are extremely interested in getting this solved. So they were very helpful with this. I had a lot of questions for them. They were answered every question I had for them. Yeah. So you can go, you can actually go visit them and see what they have to say they are on facebook under long walk home ua and then they have a website which is long walk home ua.com if you want to find out more and read up about her as well as some additional information in regards to both suspects you can do that there if you have any thoughts or questions please let us know you, you can leave your comments your questions on instagram or you can send those directly over to us facebook wherever wherever you want you can you can send those to us. yeah and we'll look forward to seeing what you think about this and whether you think the same as us fingers crossed yeah. well thank you this case was really interesting thank you and we've done a lot of chatting about this over the last week or so and it's been um yeah it's been a mm-hmm. crazy one to cover so thanks for that it's really good yeah i'm kind of sad we're moving on from this one i mean yeah i, yeah, I too not, yeah not moving on like this is one that we're definitely going to follow but yeah moving on from our from our you know digging. heavy <laughs> investigation and yeah. our digging yeah. yeah so this is one that hopefully um will stay at the top of our list and we'll hopefully have some sort of resolution one it's day in, in the crimepedia file it's there underneath under a it's there filed it is there under a oh you know i do have a question mm-hmm. now i'm thinking about it mm-hmm. so we have our our creepo meter our oh, david nielsen yeah, creepo meter. We so do. we have two suspects that we can throw up okay so let's go with suspect number one brent strutner what where do you put him on the david nielsen creepo meter I think he's going to have to be a three because I think he was more, yeah. I don't think he was as creepy. I think he was more mentally unstable. So I wouldn't say mm-hmm. he was as creepy, but ah, oh, that old Chris, he's going to have to be up there on four. He's Chris. not a Dennis Nielsen, but he's creepy. Yeah. yeah he's going to have to go definitely, on four. Definitely a creeper. Definitely. All right. Definitely. Well, there we go. Welcome to the creepo meter, Chris <laughs> Winchester. <laughs> You're there. There on the creepo meter there. forevermore. You're on the register forevermore. <laughs> There's no taking exactly. you off. <laughs> nope. You're not coming off. Wow. All right, Cherry. Well, thank you for listening and joining in. And Yeah, no worries. It's been yeah. good, actually. It's been yeah, very, very interesting case. I'll keep an eye on this one and yep. um, look out for everybody else's thoughts. And we will be back next week with another, another case for you. We will. And as always, be nice. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>